Hello everyone. Um, I am the Chief Executive of Genetic Alliance UK. I'm also the Chair of the Rare Disease UK campaign and I'm the parent of a young man affected by an ultra-rare condition recently referred to genetics. So I feel as though I have a triple stake in the discussions here today. And I brought with me some notes for my presentation and I'm so pleased to have been here for the whole day because there have been so many engaging and informative presentations and questions that my notes have filled up over the course of the day as I've found new ideas and new thoughts and new knowledge to take home with me. So I'd like to try and address some key questions today. The first being, um, where is or will be the place of genomics in modern medicine? I'd like to explore a little bit about what patients want and what patients might need. And also think about whether we can learn from current approaches to patient involvement in resource allocation decision making. And in particular, I'm going to look at um, two uh, decision making structures, one for genetic testing and one for newborn screening. But first a little bit about Genetic Alliance UK for context. We're a membership organisation and we have a membership of over 200 patient organisations who variously provide direct support and information to patients and may also fund and support research. We provide upskilling opportunities for our membership and vitally we provide opportunities to participate in our own research and the research of others and to input and influence policy development. We're also home to the Rare Disease UK campaign and we have over 2,000 individual um, supporters and also 300 patient organisations in our membership. We campaign for implementation of the UK strategy for rare diseases. We provide the secretariat to the all-party parliamentary group on genetic rare and undiagnosed conditions. And through our patient empowerment group, we provide input to initiatives such as NCARD's National Congenital Anomalies Register Service at Public Health England and into initiatives such as 100,000 Genomes. And finally, we're home to SWAN UK, which provides um, direct peer support to over 2,000 families who have a child or young person with complex needs and an undiagnosed condition of likely genetic origin. And it's through our SWAN UK um, function that we've supported recruitment into 100,000 genomes. We also carry out public engagement and awareness raising. Throughout my presentation, I'm going to be drawing on a number of our projects and initiatives, reports of which can be downloaded from our website. And our ways of working include evidence gathering and analysis, survey-based research, deliberative groups, workshops, and community consultations. And together, these reports form a body of work that gives us considerable insight into the views of patients and advocates as they relate to genetics, uh, genome sequencing, and the sharing of genetic data and its utility. And the first of these listed is our 2014 report, What Do Patients Think About Genome Sequencing in the NHS?, which is particularly relevant, which was commissioned by Genomics England and helped to guide the 100,000 Genomes Project and the development of information for participants. I'd like to reflect on the nature of um, genetic rare and undiagnosed conditions. So we have 7,000 or so known or potentially diagnosable rare diseases, and around 80% 80, 80 of these currently are known to have a genetic origin. So um, as has already been mentioned by previous speakers, while some rare diseases are vanishingly rare or ultra-rare, um, in fact, in aggregate, they will affect 3.5 million um, people in the UK who are currently alive today at some point during their lifetime. And also, um, of the 6,000 babies who are born every year without a diagnosis with a condition of likely genetic origin, on current figures, around half of these children are likely to remain undiagnosed. Or to put it another way, their diagnostic odyssey will be unending.
There's room for much improvement in terms of access to diagnosis, care and treatment for rare disease patients in the UK. Um, it's staggering to think that the um, travel of one to two hours and at least three clinics um, at least quarterly and the enormous burden that places on families and carers just in terms of the amount of time that has to be dedicated to attending what can often be fragmented appointments. It's also interesting to note, though I can't quite read my slide here at this distance, that the average rare disease patient waits four years before receiving a diagnosis. And I do know of one patient who actually waited 50 years in the extreme. And that one in three patients report receiving more than three incorrect diagnoses. Now, we've heard why it matters in terms of health care and access to the most appropriate care and treatment. And um, I think what's often not uh, as well appreciated is that a diagnosis, whether or not it's actionable, whether or not there's a dedicated treatment that will address your needs in terms of your diagnosis, having a diagnosis can improve matters a great deal in terms of the support that families receive from social care, welfare, and in terms of education. It can unlock many doors. It can also unlock the door to finding a community where you can find emotional support and social support through the third sector. When I was um, preparing um, this presentation, um, I struggled a little bit to know what genomic medicine actually was in the context of today. And I think other presenters are very articulate articularly um, express the challenge of determining how we evaluate um, the cost effectiveness of genomic medicine. Is it just a process of diagnostics? Is it um, related to pharmacogenetics or personalized medicine? And does it involve novel therapies such as gene therapy? And how do we evaluate these individually or as a coherent package? Now, this slide has absolutely nothing to um, do with genomic medicine. Um, it is, in fact, a picture of some x-rays. And the picture on the left is possibly the most famous um, x-ray picture, um, possibly with the exception of photo 51 from Franklin's collection of x-ray diffraction images. And it's the fuzzy image of the internal structures of the human hand, and it's the first x-ray taken of a human subject. And on the right, of course, we have a CT of a human um, torso. And um, while I was mulling over the question of, um, I think Ron Zimmern this morning called it genetic testing exceptionalism, um, this question of how we pay for and evaluate costs and move costs around within the NHS, do we include in tariffs or do we strap out of tariffs those costs? It makes me think of... Um, at the moment, I feel that knowing the full potential impact of genomics on healthcare is about as difficult as it could have been for Röntgen to know the full impact of X-rays. So X-rays now um, are integral to the health service; they are used in diagnosis, but also in treatment, for example, in radiotherapy. So I just wanted to look across. Um, the, the pathway in terms of the rare disease patient's um, journey. Um, and I think part of the problem is that other presenters have articulated is that there are challenges in determining where genomic medicine has the potential to impact um, and how to evaluate these because it could be at multiple points across the journey. So patients don't always receive a correct or conclusive um, diagnosis. But the diagnostic odyssey tends to begin at the point where symptoms manifest. And with the correct diagnosis, there may be the possibility of treatment that prevents a, a trajectory which could be declining health, increasing disability, reduced quality of life, increasing health burden, and increasing cost to the NHS on the path um, to end of life. And this is the path that genomic medicine promises to change or disrupt. So as we're focusing narrowly on genetics and um, genomics um, diagnostics, um, again, the question of, is it a question of um, to what extent does genome sequencing replace genetic testing? 
Is there a question about cost and practicality of genome sequencing at birth um, versus the limited cost of screening in our current newborn system? And is it um, the considerations rela relating to the costs of differing treatments, pre and post diagnosis, and the prevention of accumulation of disability or ill health? Regardless of what we don't know about how to cost and evaluate genomics in healthcare, what we do know is what patients want. Involvement in decision making is a top priority for patients, not only in relation to decisions about their own care but also in relation to wider decisions um, that guide what is and what isn't available in the NHS. Individuals have preferences with respect to what information they would wish to receive about their health, for example, incidental findings from testing, and they have preferences too about how and when they receive this information. Um, and in order to deliver against these preferences, feel that counselling is key. So patients want access to trained and knowledgeable counsellors, both before and after testing. A key expectation from patients in relation to genomic medicine is that the information generated be used not only for diagnostic care and treatment for themselves, but also for others. And patients and families would like to receive um, their diagnosis and therefore access to the most appropriate care and treatment sooner. And as we've seen um, for the undiagnosed community, the initial expectation of rapid turnarounds from 100,000 Genomes Project haven't been fulfilled. So it's really encouraging to hear earlier from Ellen that um, these timelines will be considerably shortened by the introduction of the Genomics Medicine Service. So we have some implications for um, resource allocation. And I think the one that is striking me now is, um, in particular, this desire to have dedicated genetic counselling before a genome is sequenced, because I think this is something that could be problematic based on Ellen's, Ellen's presentation, um, because she has been clear that we don't currently have the capacity within the NHS, because we only have around 200 counsellors, to um, deliver against this preference. There are four domains um, that I'd like to explore. There are four ways, in fact, in which patients should be entitled to contribute to um, decision making in healthcare. As policy makers, we should be able to contribute to the design of the process for delivering policy. As decision makers, uh, we're a major stakeholder in healthcare, so we should have a say over how healthcare resources are allocated. And these roles should be along side other stakeholders and as equal peers. For example, as a member of a committee that makes access decisions. As experts, patients and patient groups, especially in rare diseases, are often leading experts in their condition and they should be able to contribute evidence to a decision-making process and this evidence should be considered on a par to other forms of evidence that the decision-making process accepts. As individuals, when making access decisions, we should remember that patients are usually able to make collaboratively informed choice with their clinician as to what is right for them as individuals. And we should make sure that we make any access decision with this in mind and avoid any temptation to be paternalistic. Now, the European Medicines Agency has a good model for successful implementation of these principles through the Patient and Consumer Working Party and through the democratic processes of the European Union, patients have had a role in the design of decision making at the agency. And patient representatives are in the room for all scientific committee meetings as equal members in all but one. So I think that also um, there are some resource questions related to the um, involvement of patients in decision making. And that is that um, if we are to include and empower patients, we need to maximise their impact and we need to be able to support their recruitment and their integration into the process, which is not always the case. So how do current approaches in the UK stack up against those principles and what can we learn? Firstly, um, newborn screening. Around um, 800,000 newborns are screened every year for just nine conditions. 
at birth. And this stacks up incredibly poorly against other European countries and various states in the US, Canada and elsewhere, where in some instances around 29 um, conditions can be identified through newborn screening. Here is what we get from newborn screening. Um, from screening the almost 700,000 newborns born in England each year at a cost of just over a million pounds, we identify 836 babies who have a condition that can be treated, for which there exists um, a treatment that will change the course of their condition um, or their lives. But there are some um, key issues with the way that decisions have been taken about what's included in the newborn screening programme. The requirement for a treatment, um, so the wider benefits that we've discussed, the social, the welfare, um, the emotional, the mental health benefits are not taken into account, and the wider societal impacts are not taken into account. There are unrealistic, unrealistically high and somewhat circular evidence requirements, and it can take many years for a decision to be taken. For example, a recent decision to pilot skid screening took several years and several iterations to reach the point of a pilot. Uh, it's a utilitarian decision, and there's a high value placed on possible anxiety to parents of unaffected newborns due to false positives, which our community feels is a minor consideration. There's a lack of transparency, and again, this UK program is um, very limited in scope. There was a recent consultation in relation to the introduction of newborn screening for SCID in the UK. And this would be a PCR-based screening strategy at an estimated cost of £3.2 million per year. To put it into context, there are approximately 17 SCID cases in the UK each year, five to six of whom would be detected through cascade screening, so without the need for a screening programme. And the main benefit here, of course, is the ability to find and treat babies before they become infected. Um, the model used by the screening committee estimates that without screening, eight babies would die from infections, and with screening, that that would be reduced to around two. Um, so the consultation was three months long, and there were 11 responses, including from Genetic Alliance UK, um, and it was a targeted consultation, so the proposals were sent to around 20 individuals and organisations. I think that this comment that was included in the response from one of the respondents really um, speaks to the, indeed, I'll use their words, bewilderment, frustration and anger of many um, groups who find that um, there is a test that could identify at birth, there are treatments, but that we don't have inclusion in the UK screening programme. For this reason, Genetic Alliance UK is embarking on a new uh, project later this year, uh, which will create a patient charter for newborn screening to identify what really matters to patients during that process and what might be improved. Moving on to the UK genetic testing network. Um, now, the UK GTN was set up in 2002 and existed for 15 years with a remit to promote high-quality, equitable laboratory services for patients and their families who require genetic advice, diagnosis and management. And we heard earlier on from other speakers that it seems to have missed the mark in terms of equitable access to genetic testing. The first directory or list of tests that are available on the NHS was published in 2003 and um, 2008 saw the first data collection of genetic testing rates. The decision-making process of UKGTN didn't look at cost, it didn't look at cost impact, it didn't look at cost effectiveness. It used an ACCE decision-making process. It considered analytical validity, clinical validity, clinical utili utility, and ethical, legal, and social implications. So I've um, pulled um, this diagram from the fifth report of UK GTN in 2017, just before its functions moved over to NHS England. Um, this report was published. Now, um, in these structures, there was room for patient involvement and patient representation, including on the Genetic Test Evaluation Working Group. Representation came from Rare Disease UK, Genetic Alliance UK, the MPS Society, CLIMB, CGD Society. Um, so there was good, there was 
good input, I believe, in terms of how those tests were evaluated and introduced. The average cost per patient of new tests in the most recent additions to um, the um, list of tests that are available on the NHS cost in the range of £100 to £1,500. And I think that's interesting to compare to the £8,000 total cost that was quoted by James earlier in relation to whole genome sequencing. The um, quantum of genetic testing was increasing at an, eight, uh, an estimated 18% per annum. Um, and really, the decisions were taken on affordability in terms of what tests were made available to which patients. Um, interestingly, though, although we saw um, changes in technology, very few um, genetic tests and the directory have ever been commissioned. And so, again, it's good to know that NHS England will be addressing testing prioritisation under the new um, genomics medicine service. So in 2017, the functions of UK GTN transferred to NHS England and the annual cycle for evaluating tests paused. And interestingly, uh, the UK um, GTN Clinical and Scientific Advisory Group ceased to exist, and that's the group on which I um, was the patient representative on behalf of Genetic Alliance UK. So we're yet to see the new directory, um, and we're really um, waiting to hear what form, if any, patient advocate involvement in decision making and resource allocation in the context of the new genomics medicine service will take. Here's my um, declaration of interests. You can find um, our sources of funding on our website. And um, what I really wanted to do was just to leave um, the last word to the mother of um, a child from our undiagnosed Swan community who believes that it's just not an option anymore that anyone should be without a diagnosis. Thank you.